My name is Karute Kanyinga. I'm uh, your host, but I'm a student at the University of Nairobi. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to say a big welcome to the Institute for Development Studies, uh, University of Nairobi. We are your host tonight on this uh, particular event, and uh, in collaboration with the Wilton Park Institute and uh, African Leadership Center. IDS and African Leadership Center have been collaborating for many years now, are doing things together on areas of social governance, if we can say that, um, on the continent. Those who are not familiar with what IDS stands for, that's the Institute for Development Studies. We are the oldest institute for development studies in Africa, and I would say probably across the world, because we were started way back in 1965 when 85% uh, percent of you were not born. We were starting to study development in post-colonial Africa and to look at development trends in the colonies, um, in the post-colonial post, uh, Africa from then. And um, all of the years we've been providing support to government, development partners, civil society organizations or NGOs, if you may, in the area of uh, development policy development research, among other issues. Well, I, I, I must apologize that there was a time we were a, a, a sincerely we were a Marxist institute uh, when back in the 70s, but the toll has taken on us, like everyone else, we don't know who we are today. We were on the left side for many years, making leftist policies for a long time, but I think we have suffered the consequences of neoliberal policies from the 1990s to a point where we don't know actually what our real identity is. And we don't know what our real identity is because we have become multidisciplinary, where we quarrel among disciplines, but I can tell you uh, economists are not comfortable with us anymore, just like they are not comfortable with anyone else. But I believe they are not very comfortable with the trend um, uh, uh, with us. I, I'm just provoking economists now so that at least we give them room to start talking uh, when they begin uh, making their talk. Uh, so that's where we are. And um, I can say at present what we have been doing uh, um, is uh, we've got five different research themes that cut across different um, uh, areas from governance and development to climate change and natural resource development to issues of inclusive development and also we are the uh, organization that carries out from barometer surveys and manages from barometer uh, surveys in the, uh, in the region. And I'm mentioning this for especially for students who are here uh, to tell them uh, that there is a room for you to start looking for uh, social science data from the Afrobarometer data platform um, that will help you uh, at least improve some of your work, I mean, some of what you do by looking at what is happening uh, uh, in terms of social development uh, across, across the region. But let me also try to speak to present day's uh, theme of um, uh, this particular workshop, but in particular the question of the youth. <laughs> There's no other better time to speak about the issue of the youth in Africa today than today because if we look at where we began uh, from the period of the early 1990s, those of you who are familiar with the return of multi-party democracy and the end of military rule in Africa will agree with me that that particular space was occupied by the youth in Africa. The protest movements of the early 1990s were well, the protest movements led by the youth of Africa, beginning in urban areas and spreading to the rural areas. And if you remember, in places like DRC, the youth were actually starting even parliament, youth parliament of people without shoes, parliamentary duvu. If you look at across Nigeria, Ghana, and the whole of West Africa, Again, you find protest movements that were led not by urban elites, but the, by the youth who are, who are asking very big questions about the future of the state in Africa. And if you look at those particular protest movements of those particular days, one thing was common. The youth were asking for reforming the post-colonial state in a big way. 
and restructuring the post-colonial state in a manner that brings sense to the African realities. Unfortunately, as this issue, and Wamba Dia Wamba, the late Wamba Dia Wamba, and a good word for such protest movements, almost every time they succeeded, the African elites would hijack such movements. And revolution from below would become revolution from above. And the danger with revolution from above, as we have known it across Africa, is that they bring piecemeal reforms. Piecemeal reforms that make very little sense in terms of reforming the African state in any big way, or even the African society. And if one were to look at the present day movements, social movements again, we'll say, actually, still the youth are present, but there is a difference that we see today. Maybe I'm wrong, but I may want to say I see some certain contradictions. There are certain contradictory tendencies with the democratic and protest movements in Africa today compared with the protest movements of democratic change and reforms of the 1990s. I'm saying there is contradictory tendencies because across Africa, around the election time, we witness two different types of movements. There is violence for hire, and there is violence for democracy. And the violence for hire has become a very common example across Africa, utilized by both governments and opposition politics to outcompete one another. If you look at the case of Nigeria in recent times, the elections that were held in Nigeria, you'll see the two types of violence taking place simultaneously. In Kenya here too, in our elections that were held fairly recently, and in the protest movements that are taking place, you'll again see the two tendencies competing against one another. The violence for hire by the African elites and the violence for democratic change. All of them out competing one another. I may be wrong, but I believe the struggle to reform the African state is not anywhere near the end. But we must learn from the works of people like Mahmoud Mamdani, who have told us to be very cautious about how we tame the African state, or even our reading of the African state, that maybe we have been using theoretical lenses that do not make sense. Or maybe we have been using theoretical lenses from outside, and therefore ill-equipped for what we are. And I must admit, this is the high time we started asking big questions about politics of exclusion and even politics of inclusive development and asking ourselves, where do the two meet one another? Unless we get answers to politics of exclusion and get answers on what can deepen inclusive development, I think we are going to continue with the two competing forms of violence across Africa. But let me also end by saying violence is not an end in itself. And those of us who study violence, it's the high time we said, we said violence itself is a voice. It's an expression. It's a mark of defense, except that violence for hire uh, seems to be having triumph over violence for democratic reforms and democratic change. Let me end up by saying, again, a big welcome to everyone here, and uh, I hope that we are going to have very fruitful discussions as we proceed. Again, uh, welcome to the Institute for Development Studies at the University of Nairobi. I look forward to having a very great conversation on Africa and the future of the youth, if I can call it that. I'm no, I know I'm rephrasing it. I am a youth also, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a youth also, you know. It's, um, because in Kenya here, we are used to, to people who are 70 years leading youth movements, right? Um, so I'm a youth also, so please forgive me. I'm one of them. I'm, I'm under 35, you know. Uh, never worry about anything because youth has no end when it comes to politics. 
Uh, Shuvai Nyonyi, please welcome and uh, uh, make your uh, remarks as well. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Karuti. Um, and uh, thank you for getting us off to a, a good start. Uh, the issue of whether you're a youth is um, debatable, uh, but I will, I will not be the one to respond to that. I will allow others to, to do so. And just uh, to let you know that even within the African Leadership Center where I come from, we do have this constant debate about who is considered young, those who feel young at heart, uh, and those who are indeed uh, uh, youth. Um, my name is Shivai Busman Nyoni. I'm the Executive Director of the African Leadership Center. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all today to this town hall discussion titled Youth, Protest and Peace Building, Conversation and Negotiation with the State in Africa. Thank you very much to all of you for responding to our invitation and for, and for coming through this afternoon uh, for this discussion. This event, as you all might be aware, is co-hosted by the African Leadership Center based here in Nairobi, but also at King's College in London. Um, the Institute for Development Studies here at the University of Nairobi and in collaboration with the African Peace Building Network of the so Social Science Research Council in New York and Wilton Park. Um, I do not see our colleague uh, Cyril Obi, Dr. Cyril Obi here. I think he's still on his way, um, who is from uh, APN, from the SSRC, um, and hopefully he will be able to join us in due course, but I think his colleague is here with us in the room. Um, since 2015, the African Leadership Center has annually collaborated with Wilton Park and the African Peace Building Network to host a series of convenings on peace building in Africa. This year, 2023, the conference themed Peace Building in Africa, Transitions, Complexities and Responses will begin here tomorrow in Kenya, in Nairobi. And together with this particular town hall brings the series to a conclusion. This is the sixth in the series um, of town hall conversations and um, has been supported over the years by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And we also have representatives of that corporation in the room and you're most welcome. The Peace Building in Africa series has always had the objective of providing a space to convene thinkers, practitioners, policy decision makers and researchers to reflect on the challenges and responses to and new thinking on peace building in Africa. Of particular importance has been that this space is not just one where you'd find a single category of people, but rather one where a variety of voices from a diversity of disciplines and sectors are coming together to not only deliberate, but in fact push the envelope on sticky and knotty issues in the area of peace building. As such, it's been very important that two things happen as part of this series, at least for us, the, the, the organizers and collaborators. One is that of representation and participation, especially of young people, many of whom both the African Leadership Center and the African Peace Building Network work with and are also in the room. From the onset, it's been important that the convening is an intergenerational one. And so we look forward to over the next couple of days having an intergenerational conversation and exchange. The second is that while the conference hosts a number of people, aspects of the conversations are able to be um, enjoyed by a larger group of people. So hence the town hall discussions. This is the second physical town hall discussion taking place as part of the series. The first was in Abuja in 2018. And during um, the COVID lockdown period, we had about three discussions, um, town hall discussions that were held online. So this sixth and final conference will critically examine and discuss emerging issues in the current peace and security landscape that will influence African peace building in the future, um, over the last few days, I'm sure many of you have been following events unfolding in Sudan, and that will surely be one of the, the, the issues I'm sure that we will discuss. Um, and also the centrality of youth and the variety of ways in which youth agency is manifesting in Africa will receive particular emphasis. This town hall in particular is intended to take a deeper dive into the questions relating to youth, their contributions to the political arena, as we heard um, Professor Karuchi talk about, 
in various contexts on the continent and the myriad ways in which young Africans are in dialogue with the state, how the state speaks back or uses silence or other means to engage young people, the notion of intergenerational dialogue and what goes heard or unheard in these exchanges is also part of this conversation. To do this, we're joined by a panel of five young Africans from a variety of backgrounds. In fact, let me say four. One of our panelists um, has been unable to travel uh, given the, 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 some challenges at the airport here in Kenya. And so she's still in Zimbabwe and has been unable to join us. Um, but maybe will we'll join us um, by the end of today or even tomorrow. Um, we have with us today, uh, let me, I'll just name the, the, the panelists and um, we have with us today Marda uh, Habtemariam Sirik Berhan, who is an Ethiopian and a PhD candidate at Syracuse University in the United States. We have uh, Victor Ochen, who is the founding executive director of the African Youth Initiative Network, AINET, in uh, northern Uganda, or working with young people in northern Uganda and other parts of the country. Victor is from Uganda. We have John Mwangi, who is a Kenyan researcher and um, He's also a next-gen fellow of the Social Science Research Council and also the African Peace Building Network. And we also have uh, Aya Chebi, who is a pan-African feminist and diplomat, who also served as the first African Union Special Envoy on Youth. Um, I'll share a little bit more detail from their very extensive bios um, as I call them up uh, to, to, to the stage. But I also want to just share that we intend this conversation to be as interactive as possible we have a number of students here, and we would really like to hear your contributions. We'd really like to hear your, your views and um, some of your own experiences in the course of the conversation. Um, after I, What we will also do as part of the conversation is it will be interspersed with um, data and findings from research that um, uh, Professor Fumi Oloni Shakin, who is the Vice President um, for uh, international engagement and service at King's College London, but also the founding director of the African Leadership Center, led and undertook together with two ALC uh, former fellows um, and researchers, uh, Dr. Damilola Adegoke and Dr. Alagao Ababu Kifle, on well-being, peace, and the state in Africa, which had a focus on youth. So we will intersperse um, our conversation with some of the findings uh, from, from, from that research. Allow me once again to warmly welcome all of you to this conversation. For those of you who have come from outside of Nairobi, Karibuni Sana, uh, we're very happy that you came and you, and you, and you honored the invitation from Wilton Park. Um, I also want to thank those of you who are Nairobi-based, especially the students, for coming out. And we're looking forward um, to a very robust conversation. And in case it, I don't have the chance a little bit later, thank you also to our partners and collaborators, Wilton Park and the Social Science Research Council. Um, Dr. Robert Grant, uh, Dr. Cyril Obi, um, Sarah Jane and others for all the hard work uh, that has gone into this and we're looking forward to a very robust final conversation um, in the series. Uh, a few housekeeping um, announcements before we proceed. The toilets, I am told, uh, for ladies, women are on the right, to my right, um, up the stairs and out the doors uh, to my right and for men, out up the stairs and out the door to the left. Um, once we finish our conversation, there will be refreshments outside. Um, so please, we will have the opportunity to interact um, and speak to one another, get to know each other a little bit more. Um, don't only speak to the people you know. Students, I encourage you, meet other people, find out where they're from, um, and you know, let the, let the networking happen. Um, so before I call on Professor uh, Fumi to come up, I'd also like the panelists to come up. Um, and so I will call you each one at a time and I want to just touch a little bit on your bio so that the room has a sense of, of who we have here. I'll start with Marda. Um, so Marda is, uh, as I said, a PhD candidate um, at uh, Syracuse University in the US um, and her research in 2019, she, her research explores the 2019 Sudanese uprising and the fundamental role of women to liberation struggles with radical possibilities. We heard Professor Karuti speak about um, the liberation struggles and the role of, of young people especially. Incidentally, today happens to be the Independence Day of the country where I come from, um, and I'm not sure how much independence we actually have, but um, this is why we have these conversations. Um, 
MADA's research interests also include African social and women's movements, grassroots mobilization, political organization, and African transformational politics. She was born and raised in Ethiopia. She has lived in Malaysia and currently re resides in the United States. Um, I will also call Victor, Victor Ochen, please come up. Uh, Victor is the founder and executive director for the African Youth Initiative Network and he was born in northern Uganda, where he spent 21 years of his childhood as a refugee in refugee camps. Um, and uh, he grew up amidst violent conflict that displaced over three million people. Um, so Victor has also first-hand experience of some of the things that we are talking about today. He formed a peace club and bravely led the anti-child soldiers recruitment campaign against the war in northern Uganda. So we look very much forward to hearing from Victor um, he has many other accomplishments, many things he's been involved in, um, both at a national and a global level. Um, I would like to invite John, John Mwangi, um, who is a researcher here in Nairobi, and he's previously served as a lecturer in peace and conflict studies at St. Paul's University in Limuru. He holds a PhD um, in international relations from USIU, the United States International University here in Nairobi. He was a next-gen fellow of the SSRC, the Social Science Research Council um, in New York, and he's also um, a fellow of the African Peace Building Network. You're very welcome, John. Uh, last but by no means least, we have Aya Chebi, who um, is a pan-African feminist and diplomat whose mission is the liberation of African women and girls. Um, she is also a blogger, a political blogger, and she rose to prominence in the 2010-2011 Tunisian Peace Revolution, Aya is from Tunisia, um, which toppled a 23-year di dictatorship. She then served as the first ever African Union Special Envoy on Youth, and she was the youngest diplomat at the AU chairper in the AU cha chairperson's cabinet from 2018 to 2021. Um, Aya, as well, serves on several boards, um, works with several organizations, and most recently is the founder of Nala Feminist Collective, Nala Fem, which is a multi-generational alliance of women politicians and activists united behind transformative fem feminist change. So thank you very much, uh, and welcome, warm welcome to the panel. We look forward to hearing from you as our conversation proceeds. So I'd now like to call upon Professor Fumi, um, who will uh, take us through and share a little bit, give us an overview of the, um, the, the findings from the research. Professor Fumi, you're welcome. Shubai, thank you very much. Oh, I was just wondering whether people can hear me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Let me first and foremost say how delighted I am to see the some, some, not by no means all, the manifestations of some of the struggles that we've had for decades. I once was young. Karuti, you once were young. Uh, <laughs> when, when we think of the kinds of things we did in the youth movement, X number of decades ago. I myself, as the vice president of a student's union in a prominent university in Nigeria at the time, X decades ago, part of what we were arguing for was that now going to traditional parlance, when it comes to questions of peace, security, justice, development, right? I just named some of the thematic issues. My people would say, and now it's spread across the continent of Africa, no matter how good a hairdresser you are, you cannot shave my head in my absence, right? If you're a good barber, you cannot be shaving my head in my absence. I have to be sitting in the room, right? If you're a good salonist, hairdresser, and you're trying to put some weaves on my head, I have to be sitting on the chair in front of you, for put it, you know, to put the weaves in my head. When I got to the United Nations in 2000, we were hard pressed to find African young people, men or women, but especially women, being part of the peace and security conversations. Remy Ajibewa, you're here from, you know, you, you, he, you, you headed ECOWAS political affairs department for years. I think we were hard pressed to find real young people, not those of us pretending to be young in some of those conversations. And so in this town hall meeting today, 
we have real evidence of the real, I almost feel like an imposter, right? I was, you know, I started this work as a youth myself, and then I stopped being youth, and all I can do is contribute to knowledge about youth, not as youth. And I'm glad that we have youth leaders in the room, intellectual leaders, policy leaders, activist leaders, who can begin to lead the discourse. And I want to say, therefore, Cyril is not in the room. I want to pay tribute to Cyril Lobby at the African Peace Building Network, because this is part of the agenda that we were co-creating to try to begin to see real change. And I think we've come to a very good place here. What we want to do is to try, it's by no means a finished piece of work. This work has been in conversation for X number of years. One of the researchers here was a fellow at the ALC when it all started in the data lab. At the end of three years, he has gathered about a billion tweets about peace in Africa. And in COVID, we had a chance to work with some of our South African partners who wanted us to look at the state of the nation of South Africa. And we thought, why don't we do this in comparative perspective and keep the line open to have a conversation? Where is, how do I control this? Can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, it, I mean, it's, this is not, this is a rapid, uh, dating process, right? Because I want to speak over three minutes to something and I'll stop the slide at a particular place. It's just that the question of peace remains unresolved. It is less researched than the question of security. And if we really, uh, and we've found this amongst ourselves, APN, ALC, all of us that have been stu studying together, walking the same road. When we did a youth vulnerability and exclusion in two, um, study in 2000 and seven to 2010 at the time, before the ALC started. The question of who youth is, the question of what peace is, what their contribution is, was laid bare. We don't have an agreement around it. And so when we talk about peace, it's always in relation to security, uh, hard security, or the absence of war. That remains a fact. And if you go to Johan Galton's um, foundational work, that remains a fact. But that's not the only story. And so let's confront the issue that we can no longer have separate pieces of research on, about things that aggregate to peace in one form or the other, which is what the question of well-being has been for a long time. It's had its own separate literature to the question of peace. And we're arguing now for an integrative approach to it because when you take all of the different, whether you're, next slide please, and I'll move this on. Whether you're looking at um, uh, the whole question of what well-being is, as in, on that slide you saw, leading a good life, right? Uh, a good life for whom? Is it created for some people and not for others, right? But ultimately, the pathway to peace, that pathway is multifarious. But the question of social, um, uh, the social structure and the violence within it is at the core of the business. Sudan is where it is today, because some of these kinds of questions are unresolved. The different conflicts we see across the continent of Africa that are manifested in violence today are where they are. So if we're pursuing peace and we're trying to say there's something that equates peace in the idea of positive peace being achieved and in the idea of well-being. So if attainment of negative and positive peace is equal to well-being, how do we get there? It's an open question. Should we even be looking at that as a combination of the roadmap from taking us away from uh, large-scale violence? But if we pursue peace only as the absence of direct violence, ultimately what we're saying is that we're camouflaging what, we, what is called uh, human misery and ill-being, all right? It is not well with the society if actually half of society is not, does not realize well-being. It is not well with that society if actually it keeps returning to war every few years. And that's the story of the continent of Africa. Next slide. So if in that sense, that's the argument we're putting on the table and that's what we're consulting around. If we're saying that we require an integrative view that focuses on the whole of society, not just a handful of people in society, in thinking about questions of peace and well-being, which we think cannot be up to the individual to guarantee because 
there are other factors involved. If, we, if that's what we're saying, then the state has to be at the heart of this conversation. Our conversation with the state has to necessarily be structured around being able to get to the question of peace for the whole of society. So those who are looking at it subjectively will say peace is in the eye of the beholder, or well-being is in the eye of the beholder. But if you look at it collectively, there is some minimum thing that you have to see in terms of what it equates for the whole of society. And that's the work that IDS does uh, and does brilliantly. But what has it got to do with youth, right? Youth has been singled out in this way because in all of the studies, and you know this, and in some of the UN resolutions, even when it's about youth, it's because of the presumption that young people are inherently violent. If we do this for them, they will be no longer be violent. And we've had these conversations before. But this category, though, becomes distinctive not just because of the average age in Africa, which is about 20 uh, years at the moment. And we see in this room uh, that kind of representation of youth uh, in Africa. But also because, whether we like it or not, youth have complex relations with the state. What do you want to say in negotiating with the state? That's part of what this conversation is about. And so, Shiva, as I leave you there, I think the first task that we want to check with you, uh, is there a next slide? Because my presentation is done. Um, we've done this work, survey data mining, uh, which I've just talked about. Gathered about one billion tweets, but we also did an online survey. But can we go to the Mentimeter question? Because this is part of the conversation. I don't want to assume that everyone has a smartphone, but I think most people have smartphones. I don't want to assume that you're all connected to EduRoom, because I've checked it, you're not all connected to EduRoom. I don't know what's happened in the University of Nairobi, but I've connected to EduRoom here several times before. You don't have EduRoom in this auditorium at the moment. If you have data on your phone, hopefully half of the room has data on their phone. The other half may not. Uh, but I think the students have their own channel. If you're a student of University of Nairobi and you have a phone, please join us in, this, uh, in answering this question, right? And that's the question. Is there value in integrating the ideas of peace and well-being from the perspective of African youth as a basis for engaging the state in Africa? It's yes, no, or not sure. We just want to feel the temperature of the room. And we'll give that a bit of time before we... Uh, give you the results. I think it's one minute to do it. If you find it, if you connect to it, answer please yes, no, or not sure. Uh, just to give us a sense. And because Shiva is going to be in conversation with our panelists, we thought we will intersperse what we found in the online surveys that we did, in the, uh, in the online data. We'll intersperse that check it, and the leaders in the room will engage in their own conversation. I hope that's fine. And Shiva, you can share the results if you want, when you're ready. The scores will be on, on the screen for you when you're ready. When you're ready. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so yeah. much, uh, Professor Fumi. Um, so we, we'll come to our panel now. Um, and again, I think we have a really wonderful uh, a really wonderful spread of uh, people coming from different parts of the continent, and we will hear various experiences. So to kick us off, um, we're going to ask our panelists to speak to, to speak to us for a few minutes about what it means to each of them. So what does it mean to you to be in conversation with the state? Um, and how have you been in conversation, in negotiation with the state in your own experience um, in the work that you do, perhaps, or uh, just in your, in, in your own life. So we'll start with, uh, with Marda, and then we will, we will come uh, this way. So you have about three minutes, please. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate being here, and I'm so honored to be here sitting with my co-panelists. So personally, I guess as the vice chairperson of the Global pan Africa Movement uh, North America delegation, I would have to say I'm, I have not been in negotiation with the state, rather in criticism or in contestation to the state, 
uh, particularly because the African state is not organized to serve the interests of the people at large. And I think uh, also Professor Karuti kind of started to tell us about the theoretical deficits of the nation state and its applicability to Africa in mention of Wamba Diwamba and Mamdani's work. So, um, however, I'll talk about the youth in Africa as a whole and how they've been on the move to negotiate and challenge their states in numerous ways. For instance, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Arab uprising and the attempt to separate North Africa from other parts of Africa based on the vague and unfounded distinction of Arab and African. But how many of us know that in 2011, 26 African countries were experiencing popular protests? Um, and these demonstrations were not only anti-imperialist, they were anti-racial capitalism, they were pro-liberation, they were pro-solidarity, all of which pushed the state to recognize its responsibility and accountability to the people. And for anyone who's following what's happening um, on the continent today, popular protest has been erupting from west to east, from north to south. For instance, we've all heard of the recent uh, wave of coups in West Africa in the region. But how many of us have heard of the succeeding and preceding protests that have been launched by youth in these countries? And all of us have heard of the xenophobic attacks in South Africa, but how many of us have heard about how many youth are protesting daily in solidarity with so many other Africans that are experiencing different oppressions and exploitations on the continent? Um, so another good example, I think, with negotiating with the state, maybe the recent youth mobilization we witnessed in the elections in Nigeria. Despite the contestation of the results of the elections in court, what should be of importance to us all is that in a highly precarious situation, young Nigerians were able to organize and mobilize to get 93 million people to register to vote. And this puts the state at task. I repeat, 93 million, that's larger than the population of Kenya as a whole. And so that's no small feat. In fact, it shows us the impact youth can have in the political arena. Imagine if you can sustain the organizing of 93 million people on the basis of shared visions and ideas, which I believe is central to statehood. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you also for adding some, some, you know, some terminology to our lexicon, so <laughs> criticism and contestation. Um, and also these examples of the popular uprisings just in 2011 alone. Um, and the numbers that you're talking about in terms of youth participation and youth engagement. So if we imagine that as 93 million people actually speaking back to the state and state institutions and state mechanisms. So thank you very much for that. Um, Victor, we'll, we will come to you next. Please, uh, the same question. So your own examples, if you've been in conversation with the state in negotiation or perhaps it's criticism and contestation. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I feel I'm louder than you, so, which is good, right? Yeah. I am from Uganda, and uh, most of you know about uh, Uganda as a country with a lot of histories mixed. We have walked along corridors of uh, mileage, journey, the trajectories of our life has been defined by so many hiccups, progress, you know, under development in so many ways. So if I have ever been in negotiation or with the government or have I ever been in confrontation with the government, uh, it's always been sometimes worrying enthusiasm in me, which I also see it in other young people. Sometimes young people want to step forward with courage. They put aside their fear to say, we want change. Change always comes no matter what. But the question comes, uh, you know, always sometimes the, the more you resist change, the hardest it happens, but it comes. So on my own account, all these years that we've been working, we, have, we thought that the best way to resist probably the temptation of doing more harms is to act not like bees. Sometimes bees are okay. When you throw the beehives, they fall down, and of course, once it's down, the bees will come and sting you. But every bee that stings dies. Are we aware of that? Yes, so we always avoid that. In as much as we want to sting whatever we don't agree with, know that it also comes with a price to pay. So what we have always chosen is how much can we be peaceful to avoid the repeat of what we don't agree with? If we don't agree with in injustice, yes, it's okay to pursue peace and development, but it's also important not to overlook at injustice. We do believe in principles of that let justice prevail. 
but peace means nothing if it undermines the principles of justice. Justice means nothing if it undermines the principles of accountability. And accountability too means nothing if it undermines the principles of fairness. And then comes in, what about fairness? It means nothing if it undermines the principle of humanity. So our intervention, how do we make sure in whatever step we are taking, life first. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, I wonder if we might hear a little bit more from you later about what you mean exactly by being peaceful in pursuing justice, yeah. but um, you know what that exactly looks like. Uh, but we, we, we'll come back to that. Um, John, I'm going to ask you to, to make some of your opening remarks and respond to the question. Thank you. It's not my fault. Uh, well, it, it works now. Uh, thanks, uh, the organizers of this meeting, uh, for having us here. Uh, this question uh, is interesting to me in the sense that I have not been in that negotiation with the state per se, but I would, I would reflect a little bit from my experiences as, as, as an academic and as a researcher, working around uh, questions of youth, peace building and so on. Uh, of course, at one point, I uh, focused on the, on the negatives, you know, what are the, uh, when you study aspects say, of, of crime and violence, there's always the negative narrative uh, that you encounter. Uh, but of course, now, uh, moving uh, to a different space, to a policy space now, I'm, I'm utilizing uh, some of the research perspectives that come out of the field to generate uh, appropriate uh, policy prescriptions. So uh, my own research uh, under the African Peace Building Network and also the Next Gen Fellowship were largely around questions of violent extremism and so on. So I would say my engagement uh, at different levels has been to see what are some of the you know, underlying causes of some of these uh, social questions, uh, how do social movements, you know, recruit and, and mobilize and so on. But then also now thinking around how do you overcome, you know, questions of, of structural violence, uh, questions of inequality, uh, but also, you know, broader uh, thinking about questions of how do we reform individuals who have crossed the line uh, in some way. So I would say my conversation really has been around you know, how, can we, you know, how can we make uh, the African state uh, more responsive uh, if you think of uh, questions such as political participation. Uh, I mean, if you look across the continent generally, uh, there seems to be voter apathy, for example. Uh, young people generally are choosing to stay away from political processes. And as researchers, uh, sometimes we uh, I mean, you have to constantly think why is it that, for instance, in a population of, say, 90 million or so, only, say, 20% or 30% of people turn out to vote. Yeah, it, it is also a form of communication and so on. So I would say my interface at this point is to see uh, what are the different questions that impact on young people, if it is political participation, how can we bring them back to the ballot, how can politics make sense to younger folk, and of course, that uh, can help, you know, to, to, to create the, the desired social contract and so on, yeah. Excellent, thank you for that. So just uh, spelling out for us some of the spaces that you are researching, um, where some of these conversations uh, are happening. And thank you for that point on low vo voter turnout being um, part of the conversation, basically, and needing, us needing to understand what, what that says. Um, Aya, let's, let's come to you now. Um, how have you been in conversation with the state, in negotiation, and has the state spoken back? What, 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 what is happening for you? Thanks. Thank you so much. You can hear me, right? Um, just out of curiosity, because this age thing has been looming around, who identify as a young person in the room? Whether, by a show of hand. Who thinks you're a young person? We would not judge you, it's okay. <laughs> um, I think my, my 
relationship with the state has evolved. Um, and, I, and I really struggle with even the concept of state because I'm a Pan-Africanist, so I believe that uh, in the 60s, they united around building nation states. They had the liberation movement to get independence and nation states. I think my generation, the millennials, when we started protesting, we wanted a borderless continent. So I always treat Africa as one continent, and I struggle with this member states um, as individual entities. But I had to deal with it because I worked in the African Union. Um, I think I started as a beneficiary of the state. I was just receiving education, free education from the state. So I was just growing up receiving what I thought is the service of the state. Until 2010 in Tunisia, um, we started a revolution. I was part of the youth movement and I think I would consider my relationship with the state at that time a complete distrust of the state. Um, I was on the end of the revolutionary, state was in the end of the dictatorship, the authoritarian regime. So my, and, and there was violence, of course, and over 600 people died. And uh, you know, the, the anger and the um, distrust was to end the regime by all means. Um, but the majority of the movement which I was among them, chose nonviolence. So there was a small, small um, portion of violence in that. But I think in, in that relationship, the, um, after a revolution, there is a democratic transition, and that relationship is more of hope with the state. So you don't trust the state, you don't give it 100%, but you're trying to rebuild with the state, whatever is there. And I think we've been, in Tunisia's experience, at a crossroad where we actually excluded everybody from the uh, old regime. It was a one-party system. So, and then we found out 80% of Tunisian population is the regime. <laughs> so how can you exclude the majority of the people who led these ministries, these institutions, you know, across all structures of society? They are the regime. So, and, and I think that's when we moved from a politics of exclusion, I think the keynote speaker mentioned it, to coalition building. Um, and actually, you know, shaking hand with the former regime to uh, rebuild Tunisia and move forward. Um, I think my relationship from there, um, as, as, as you mentioned, there has been many protests and, and, you know, we call it the revolution of dignity. The Arab Spring is a Western narrative, so I wouldn't, and I know there are books written on it, but that's not our narrative. Um, but from there, we were supporting other movements and I was also you know, part of supporting Yonamar movement in Senegal, Burkina Faso, Bali Citoyen, when the fees must fall started and then we arrived until Sudan Revolution and SARS and so on. It, it's really like a range of movements. And then I had different relationship with the state in the activist hat, right? So I was banned from Egypt, I was denied visa from other countries. So that's also a relationship of distrust with, with the state. Once I went, and, I, and it was a conscious decision, okay, we, when we have distrust with the state and we're really um, trying to make change in our countries, and our continent, you reach a point after eight years of activism, things are not moving <laughs> in the direction you want them to move. So is this the only way to make change? And I think that's a, um, a conversation I had with myself. What are other ways to change or reform or transform the system? And one other way is to be part of the system. And when you go into the system that you're challenging it, um, you either get co-opted into it, or you become activist within the system. And I think that's when I went to the African Union, I became the youth envoy, and then I had to deal with 55 member states, 55 men, until recently, president of Tanzania, 55 egos, and rivalry, you know? And I think that's when you realize that dealing with different states and where young people in different countries, how do they, do they deal with the state is, is different. Um, and this is to reach a conclusion, you know, I never thought of my relationship with the state because I always talk about young people. So it's really a good reflection that I think I have always been an objector of the status quo. So if that status quo is maintained by the state, then that's my relationship with that system. If that's that status quo maintained by a certain group, then that would be my relationship with that system. So I think for me, it's more the status quo and what does the state represent in maintaining that and, and, and how do you challenge it? And so the relationship really evolves. 
Thank you. Thank you for that, Aya. I think um, that gives us a nice um, sort of uh, semicolon or a comma in the conversation so far. Um, and we've heard a range of, of, of different um, perspectives and different ways of, of engagement um, and, and interaction with the state. And I think thank you also for, for, for explaining just the evolution, how it evolves, but also I think um, how it's different things at different times and different moments. And we've already heard that from the, 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 the rest of the, the, rest of the, of the panel. Um, I think now maybe we have the, the, the results from the uh, first question of the Mentimeter, uh, which is that, um, so we have a total of 30 people who were able to respond. 29 responded that yes, they do think that there is value in integrating the ideas of peace or well-being from the perspective of African youth. Um, as a basis for engaging the state in Africa. So I also wonder, for all of you, I think, uh, Marda, you talked about this when you talked about 93 million um, young people engaging, especially around elections, right? Um, but the extent to which the views of those young people were then taken into that process. Mm -hmm. So overwhelmingly, the room has said that, yes, they believe that there should be um, um, integration of the ideas of well-being from the perspective of young people into the state. So yes, how do we include the, the, the views such as what uh, Victor told us about being peaceful even in engaging with issues of injustice, the research and the knowledge production uh, that, that, that John was talking about, and as, as, as Aya said, the evolution of um, your identity, the way you engage, the way you interact, and even the way you deal with violence, non-violence, and realizing that 80% of a society is actually um, part of the, of the system or the, or the structure and how that shapes um, your engagement going forward. I'm going to now ask um, Dami Lola, Dr. Dami Lola Adegoke, who, was, who also was part of the research, to just speak a little bit um, on the next uh, set of uh, slides or findings before we come back um, to you as panelists. All right. Uh, my name is Dan Lolaregoke. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the African Leadership Center at King's College London. I'm going to be speaking on, on the methodology that we use for this particular study. So I'm going to provide a kind of brief run through of some of the essential approaches that we use to extract and mine some of the data. Uh, like Professor Fumi mentioned earlier, um, we have a data, uh, at least we are, I can boldly say that we are about the whole institution on the continent with a data uh, lab on African uh, peace and uh, security and development. So in case you have anything, uh, in case you need any data on uh, peace, security and development on the continent, you can contact us. Uh, yeah. So on the methodology for the study, uh, we focused more on Twitter and Facebook because, uh, primarily because Twitter is very common on the continent. Uh, in particular, research on some of the, uh, the most preferred social media platform for communication by youths on the continent, mentioned Facebook and Twitter in nearly all the countries. So we, we chose Twitter and Facebook uh, for that purpose. And uh, for Twitter, we, we focused, because we, uh, the main point of event is co was COVID-19, so we mined data from January, 2020, January 1, 2020 to June 30, 2022 to, to cover the, uh, the COVID period, and we're able to uh, we're able to, using the algorithm and the, the particular uh, platform that we have and tools that we have in house, we're able to organize and collect a total of around 252,480 tweets. Yeah, uh, in all, South Africa 26,838, uh, Nigeria 225,642. How, how we're able to do that? Minding, I mean, not uh, overlooking the fact that Facebook has limited geo. Uh, any form of geo data, in case uh, geo tag data, there are limitations to what you can get. So what we did was to uh, filter the query to only focus on pe where peace and a particular country is mentioned, like peace South Africa, peace Nigeria. So we were able to gather all these tweets. And having done that, so for us to be able to analyze the data, so we went, because one, most of the problems that people face, and nearly most of, some of the literature on that subject, uh, they focus more on content analysis. And if you are from Africa, certain, some people may say something, the same thing, the same words, but 
in different, maybe in any, some of your languages, you would have witnessed some of these uh, instances where the same sentence might mean multiple, might uh, elicit multiple or generate multiple meanings. So to be able to be sure, so we did what we call a content context analysis to place the content besi beside the context uh, to be able to do that. So having done that, we were able to now narrow down. We did simple random sampling uh, of essential tweets and we're able to get 379 tweets that we focused on it eventually. Next slide. Yeah, so for, okay, for peace discourse, for Facebook survey, what we did, what we did for Facebook survey, let me, let me mention that. For Facebook survey, we, we organized a kind of online Facebook platform, and for ethical reasons, we didn't offer any form of uh, uh, maybe financial inducement or encouragement to people. So we asked them to be natural about it, to get their content, and we targeted specific age groups, uh, the, youth, the, so, the youth age groups, I think from 16 and 18, because of you will need ethical approval in case you want to go below that. So for those who are within particular categories, 18, I think 18 and around uh, 35 or thereabouts. So we, we, we narrowed that down and we were able to collect some of the responses from people in real time. Um, uh, sorry, Ian, the slide after that. So for, okay, that's for the Facebook. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we were able to uh, survey around 100 participants. 45% were between 26 and 35. 29% between 16 and 25 years, and 20% were between 36 and 45 years, those who identified as youth as well. So some of the questions, I'm not going to, because of time, I'm not going to mention some of the questions, but from responses, we got responses from Kenya, more from Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and some other countries, from the, and then the cohort as well, so that is as projected on the screen. Um, so the slide... The slide on the chat, please. Just a quick one. The fourth slide, the chat. Or methodology. Four. All right, so, sorry, <laughs> because there's a kind of mix of, yeah, this chat. So this is just a sample of context, content context analysis. On the right, on the, yeah, on the left side, you have the, some of the categories that we extracted from how people use peace as well-being, tranquility, uh, as, uh, for re as reconciliation, as religion, and what have you, we coded that. Then we look at the context in which some of these statements, say, uh, these statements were used. Uh, in, in for, for instance, the last one, uh, in the case of condolences uh, for both South Africa and Nigeria, we noticed that when people mentioned uh, uh, rest in peace in South Africa, most of the time is around showing condolences to maybe their leaders or what have you. But the same statement, when used in the Nigerian context, it was mainly around cause when you place it beside the context. So people were cursing the leaders that they are not going to rest in peace and uh, you know, they are not going to die well, things like that. So, but, so on the surface, if you, don't, if you take something on the surface, you see rest in peace, you assume they are showing condolences. But meanwhile, differently, they were uh, focusing on different, uh, more of courses, if in case you see that. But we share that in, our, in, the, in the full report anyway. And the same thing with uh, well-being and what have you. Most people ascribe uh, prayers, uh, asking God for, I mean, to grant them peace and what have you. So we put that, and then around immigration for South Africa, because of the xenophobic thing, talking about there will be no peace in South Africa if you don't stop the immigrants. Some of these words were used in context with some of these immigration, but Nigeria, they don't really, most Nigerians don't really care about if you come to the country or not. Yeah, so that is not really feature in that area. So um, the next slide on the, sorry, I'm going to watch. Yeah, the, I've mentioned the Facebook. Yeah, so now to the result, please. Uh, the five. Facebook five, so the next, yeah, just leave this, leave this. So when we, we ask specific questions, and we're not going to take all the questions, the first question is, uh, what factors or actors prevent you from feeling at peace? Please list them. Uh, most of from, most respondents from South Africa uh, emphasize anxiety, stress, and unemployment as the top factors that prevent them from feeling at peace. Why Nigerian respondents identify, identified compromised security, bad governance, they were more about the governance, health, Social inequality, talking about war and discrimination as the key factors. Yeah, so we were able to put that in context. The next uh, slide, that the word cloud. So we also suggested some of these things, uh, the, the responses to the to word cloud to see the most frequent uh, used word around peace. Uh, you can see, as you can see, mostly about poverty, conflict, sickness, terrorism, unemployment, war at the center, 
at the core, and then maybe relationships, anxiety, tribalism. Tribalism featured in both, in all, nearly both South Africa and Nigeria in that uh, aspect, the use of the word. So uh, the next, now to the Mentimeter question. Yeah, the second one, the question two. Uh, if you can, like, what factors want to take your response? What factors prevent you from feeling at peace? Yeah. Then the code is uh, the same menti.com. The code is 25310325. Thank you. So we beg your indulgence to just uh, do this next one. I think we have one more after this, uh, Damilola. And I think just to say, as, as people are completing this particular, responding to this question, that there are a lot of um, similarities in some of the words uh, that our panelists use to talk about their own relationship with the state um, came up, I think, in the, in the word cloud that Damilola uh, showed us. Um, so let's see what we, we have in the room. Okay. So we, okay. So we, we, we'll, we'll go on, um, and I'll come back to you, panelists, as you're finishing off uh, your, your responses. And uh, following in the same vein of, um, you know, the factors that make you feel at peace, but also just to get a sense now from some of the questions that frame our, our discussion today. Um, and I have different questions for all of you this time, and we'll start with you again, Marta. Um, what impact have African youth had on the political arena um, and also contested political spaces um, in the context or the countries that you have studied or from some of your work? You had already started speaking to us about, um, um, about Nigeria um, and the kind of impact young people were having in the most recent elections there. We also know you've studied and spent some time in Sudan. Um, so what, what would you say is the impact that African youth have had on the political arena? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So thank you for that question. And allow me to take a few extra minutes because I really want to communicate to our audience today about what's really going on in Sudan. Um, and so from the Soweto uprisings of young school children that catalyzed the end of apartheid to the ongoing Sudanese revolution that has challenged an imperially supported military formation, I believe the youth of Africa have been and will be central to transforming our societies and our politics. So today, I want to talk to you all about not just youth and protest or youth and mobilization, but youth and transformation of the political arena specifically. So of all the possibilities happening on the ground in Africa, one of the most organized and sustained in the area of my studies is the ongoing revolutionary process in Sudan. So with over 500 ethnic groups and, most, uh, and more than 100 languages, different climates and different national endowments in different regions, um, Sudan has been referred to as the microcosm of Africa. So what is happening should be of importance to the global African world and especially to young Africans looking to build better futures and better states. Before I continue, I want to share my solidarity and thoughts and prayers with the Sudanese people that are currently suffering under a militarized political struggle to dominate the country. So in 2019, those of us following witnessed an autonomous and a non-hierarchical or horizontally structured networks of organization led by women and youth to subvert and challenge an Islamized military state. After four months of coordinated and sustained demonstrations, the leader of the regime, Omar al-Bashir, was removed. After eight months, the military was forced to negotiate with civilian forces. After Bashir's removal, the military had sought to take over power and take on the transition period. However, people refused and sit-ins and demonstrations continued with youth, with youth at the forefront until the military conceded to a civilian partnership. Over a period of eight months, we witnessed a new mode of politics with a participatory and representative model that did not exclude or relegate women and other exploited and oppressed groups, but instead benefited from their self-organization and political agency. We saw the power and necessity of alliances that can challenge entrenched systems and structures of oppression and exploitation. We saw at a sit-in in Khartoum that lasted 59 days that diverse communities, even those manipulated against one another, can build democratic relations and forms of governance. Different groups from tea sellers and the resistance committees collectively represent themselves 
and discussed with professionals and political parties in the political process today. On October 25, 2021, the military was threatened by this form of organization, a nucleus of a new state, I would personally say. Despite their agreement to have a joint, with civilians that is, to have a joint transition period, they staged a coup and kicked out the civilians. Young people remained in the streets calling for no compromise, no negotiation, and no partnership with the military. And this is because they had not only experienced the brutality of the military firsthand, but because they have seen what previous power sharing agreements with the military has led Sudan to. So I cannot pass without emphasizing that the Sudanese people are not only defying the military, but in defying the military, they're defying historically used divisions that, manip that manipulate differences between Arab, um, Arab Africans and other Africans, right? They're also denouncing divisions over ethnicity, over religion, over gender, and over region that has been used as a tool by the state. Nowadays, when people are killed or exploited in one region, people in other regions stage solidarity protests. The young people have also defied the formation of an Islamic state. I mean, how revolutionary is it when a Muslim-majority country rejects an Islamic state, right? And calls for a participatory and egalitarian politics and state formation. The Sudanese women are also defying patriarchal oppressions, right? And they are also teaching their brothers and fathers that they are leaders and they are going to be part of the political process whether they like it or not. All of which has really brought us to the possibilities of a democratic state in a multi-ethnic, multi-gender, multi-racial, and overall diverse society. As early as April 2019, the removal of Omar Abashir did not satisfy the youth, which continued to demand beyond superficial political changes and individual resignations, right? They're Across Sudan, the youth are mostly organized by these bodies called the resistance committees. And some of you might have heard of them, but usually these, you know, these are under Western narratives that are really not discussed. Basic, basically, young people in their neighborhoods got together, most of them never politically organized before, and started solving problems in their neighborhoods, right? And this organization began as early as 2011 and 2013. But by the time 2019 came around, there were already these across Khartoum alone already, for example, had 30 active resistance committees, right? And the committees have worked on all fronts, including street cleaning campaigns, road works, school repairs, equitable resource distribution. Um, they continue to provide social uh, services neglected by the state, but they continue to organize through horizontal networks to influence and recapture the transition process. And since the coup, they have focused their energies in removing and, rep and replacing the coup regime. There are now thousands of resistance committees all across 18 states in Sudan in rural and urban areas, and these committees are at the forefront of the attempt to transform Sudan and the state, right? The RCs, the resistance committees, are important in our discussion about state because I believe they can serve as a nucleus for a new state in Africa. They have not only been sustained for three years under dire conditions, but they're displacing and challenging the existing state formation and paving a path to form a new state. Almost each RC has its own way of organizing, but it is common to find that the dichotomy of leader and follower does not exist. It is also common to find that decisions are made democratically, which is to mean participatory and representative, right? Additionally, the RCs work with progressive wings in Sudan, such as the Sudanese Professional Association, which is a labor organization. And perhaps the best way for me to explain to you this new model of a state is to take a look at the political charter written by these resistance committees all across Sudan, right? This political charter is called the Revolutionary Charter for People's Power. I repeat, the Revolutionary Charter for People's Power. The charter, which I would invite everyone in this room to read, shows how Sudanese young people are doing the job to understand why they are in the conditions they are in and how they can change it. The charter is open to and was signed by resistance committees in different Sudanese states and professional organizations, trade unions, demand-driven organizations, women's organizations, IDP camp organizations, workers, students, and factional unions, and the political revolutionary organizations opposed to military to the militarization of political life and in devour to overthrow the coup regime. The young people organized through resistance committees wrote and rewrote this charter in a participatory process, such as announcements and accepting comments from each of their neighborhoods to outline the transition period. Meaning every time they had come to a certain point, they would call a meeting in each of their neighborhoods, they would read out the charter and they would take in comments and they would meet back to each of their networks, right? And so, after a more than almost a year of negotiations, they have finally put out a, a final chapter. And at the center of the demand of structural changes have been a refusal to imperialist and capitalist approaches to life and livelihood. The revolutionary forces have been adamant about their disinterest in foreign intervention in the transition process and overall politics. 
those participating in the resistance have not only denounced foreign aid that compromises uh, the uprising, excuse me, but organizations like the RCs have also explicitly refused transitional agreements that have neither been negotiated nor, by, nor negotiated to look for the benefits of the people at large. And so relatedly, they have prioritized their demands and aspirations in ways that life is valued over profit. These demands have once again been articulated in the charters, public statements, and the chants in the streets. At the, at the center of the demands, and as stated in the charters, have also been wealth distribution and equitable regional growth. The different levels of economic development across different regions is increasingly understood as the basis for insecurity and militarized politics. Therefore, peace is being sought not through militarism, but by addressing the economic, social, and cultural roots of the problems in Sudan. Right? Peace is, is sought to be achieved through bottom-up political processes that bring radical change to government structures and create harmony. The Charter also explicitly states that peace is to be facilitated by the Sudanese people and not by external forces. Lastly, neither peace nor justice is to be achieved by further investing in the security apparatus, but rather reinvesting Sudan's GDP into care services that the Sudanese people actually need. And that is why I would say that the primary victory of the ongoing revolution in Sudan, which should be of concern to us all in this room, is the mental freedom being cultivated by young people of Sudan. Young people in Sudan have come to understand their interdependent role and power in the historical process, including state formation which has challenged and inspired other groups in the country to follow suit. They have vowed and are working towards creating systems of governance that are accountable and accessible to all the people of Sudan in their different manifestations. Though they take lessons from the past, they are not fulfilling the wishes or resentments of their parents. They are charting their own path for unification based on the reorganization of politics and economy in the country. When other African youth understand and organize under this reality, I believe, and I have no doubt, it will be a new day in the African state. So to give a very long-winded to the question you have, African youth can have a large impact on the political arena, even to the extent of designing it, creating it, and taking primary role within it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marja, for that. Um, I, I think it was important to also give you the opportunity to speak more, because this is a situation, as they, and there are other situations, but this one is unfolding um, you know, right now as we speak. Um, and many young people continue to be impacted in spite of all the work that uh, um, young people have, have been doing. So thank you very much for that. Um, and we'll come back to you, and I'm sure our audience in a few minutes will have some questions to follow up. Um, John, I'm going to come to you now um, to follow on from uh, where, where Bada has left off. Um, so from your work, from your research, from the policy engagement you're doing, what is attributable to young people and youth organizing and participation? Thank you. Okay. And you have three minutes, John, please. Thank you. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I see this, uh, this, this, this sort of youth organization and participation both in a very sort of organic manner, but also in less organic ways. And I would like to center my reflections really on uh, just the notion especially of uh, electoral politics, for instance, because that's where we see electoral politics, but also social justice uh, kind of movement. Uh, if one were to look at the electoral space, young people, or, and I mean, we're using that term quite loosely <laughs> this afternoon, uh, but if we take the African Union's perspective of 15 to 35, and also think about people, I mean, like if you take the Kenyan example that if you're above 18 to 35, you considered uh, youth, uh, there are different ways that young people will choose to, part to participate. Uh, one is that they can choose to engage, uh, I mean, they can do voter registration. Mm -hmm. They can choose to vote or not to vote, uh, depending on uh, the circumstances that uh, on, come on board. Uh, they can also choose to engage in you know, different campaigns and, and different mobilizations. Uh, it can be on their own agency, but they can also be acting on behalf of, of, of political parties and so on. But then uh, the ways in which 
they are organizing and participating. One, you could say uh, they're relying both on traditional media, but also digital spaces, but also the art spaces uh, using, you know, music, for instance, and I mean, even beyond the Kenyan context, if you look at Uganda and the Bobby Wine movement, uh, well, I don't know if it was a movement, but really he used music uh, to, you know, to mobilize, uh, you know, voters and so on. So, but the music, of course, has some social protest in it and, and is able to uh, engage in that. So, but also young people are also in different uh, civil society organizations. If you go to places like Mazare, you'll find the Mazare Social Justice Center that really engages, you know, in different questions of governance. So they are, you know, you know, you know, from below, they're able to participate, they're able to engage, uh, especially on, you know, on, on questions of human rights, uh, question of justice, and so on. So I would say yes, uh, young people are organized in different ways, uh, whether they're engaging in protest, whether they are participating in, you know, in political parties and, and you know, choosing to, 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 to account, I mean, to run for office and so on. But of course, well aware that there are also different structural barriers that prevent them. But yes, they are engaging, but also choosing at some point not to engage. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, as you were speaking, I, you know, something came to, uh, to my mind. So, you know, in spite of all of this, both what Mada and also yourself have, have talked about, and also I think Professor Karuti uh, mentioned in his opening, there, there, there has been, a, there is a lot, and, and young people are, are engaged. But still we have this narrative um, about young people being disruptive and, you know, their disruption being negative. And, um, you know, on, on the other side, we have all this evidence that you both have, have, have uh, spoken to about their involvement, their engagement, and their presence, in the, in, especially in the political arena. So you don't have to answer it now, but if you can speak to it a little bit more, how do we close that gap between the reality, which is there through research, through data, and the narrative, which is controlled by those who, who continue to wield and, and have power? Um, let's come to Aya. Uh, Aya, we want to hear from you about, uh, you spoke about your role um, in the African Union and so you touched on some of your experience. How would you say regional and continental, and continental policy institutions engage with issues of youth-led mass protest and also transnational youth networks? You, you are part of some, you've established some, beyond the official policy articulation. Um, and what outcomes have some of these approaches yielded, if any? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I just want to also share my solidarity with the uh, Sudanese people and what's happening in Sudan. I think it's always the people who pay the price um, of these circumstances. Um, just m a reflection before I answer that question. I think from, from all what the panelists have shared, there is a, and I think also in the, in the previous speakers, this question of militarization is really, um, there is a lot of research on it, um, but I, I can't find answers. <laughs> you know, we know that there has been over 100 coup in Africa in you know, a certain period of time. We, we say 1990s ended the, the military rule, but we still see it in different ways. And, uh, and I don't think, in, in many of the work I've done with young people, I don't think, um, first of all, young people's relationship with the military goes beyond just serving your year, and that's it, but there is no, um, reflection there in youth movements around what does it mean and what is the military as an actor and how do we work with the military in certain circumstances, whether it's democratic, undemocratic, authoritarian, military rule, what does it mean? So it's something I'm also thinking about, militarization, and also in the women movement we talk a lot about militarization, patriarchy, and how there have been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, militarized um, uh, state relationship with women. The second question it really raises from the conversation, the, this idea of transition and power. We always have an amazing opportunity. When there is a revolution, there is a transition. It opens up so many opportunities. People are 100% engaged. People are fired up by change. People see hope. People are hands-on. I mean, I remember 
in 2011, we had a turnout of votes of more than 60%, which never happened after that, because that is the moment. There is change happening and everyone is invested, but I see very little um, attention, resources, strategizing around what do we do in those first 100 days? And there is a very much from different institutions um, uh, dealing with just the political elites. We don't, we don't deal with it as the whole society. What's the role of the people who went to the streets? What's the role of all these youth movements who now formalize into advocacy groups, into media collectives, into all sorts of things? And what, what do we do with this rising civil society that now has the freedom to, to protest, to organize? All these institutions that come in, whether regional or international, they deal with the political elite. We want elections. We want to make sure it's fair and peaceful, and that's, for them, a democratic process. And I think that's when we miss on, again, taking the example of Tunisia. I mean, I was 23 in 2011. If I look at all my generation right now, it's less than 2% of us have been into politics. Even though in 2011, 2012, all of us, and up to, until 2014, all of us were involved in writing the constitution and you know, the advocacy part, uh, being part of political parties, but then I, f I feel there was no foundation for that generation who has been now trained and got into political activism to move into being in the institution and actually leading roles and leading positions in the institution. So, there is, a, which happened the same in Sudan. I mean, I remember when Sudan revolution happened, I was the youth envoy and my advocacy was around how do we have young people in political leadership position. We managed to get the minister of youth and women, young women, but that's not enough. You know, how do we get them involved in the process? And that's part of why we find ourselves today, the same young activists are again, you know, bearing this, the price for, for what's happening. Um, so I would really call on anyone working in this field to have more attention into that. And then I think protest. When we, when we talk of protest, we need to reflect, um, because I feel also sometimes, this is a little bit challenging research, we, 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 we look at Africa and say, um, it failed here, this is a failed state, it succeeded here, and this is what happened. You know, we, in, in a lot of the research I, I, I engage with, and I, and I did also my research on protest and, and um, um, uh, radicalization of young people in Al-Shabaab and Daesh, but I see a lot of this judgment and not really peeling the layers of where change happened. When we said uh, Egypt revolution failed, there, there is a whole cultural revolution that happened, which completely revolutionized how young women particularly show up in public spaces. Um, who is on, in the protest? Is it middle class? Is it working class? That will also determine what happens in the transition period. In Tunisia, we have, it has been mostly working class, and that's why there is, was a lot of involvement in the democratic transition. Egyptian activists would say it's been a middle class revolution, and that's why the working class just believed in the military rule afterwards. So who really is in the protest? Um, and, and research also shows that only 10% of people actually make a revolution. So we're really talking about a tiny, tiny portion of the population. Um, on your question on the institution and the gap, so I think Dr. Fomi mentioned about the average age of the population being 20. Uh, when we compare it to the average age of leadership, 64, we, it already tells us where the gap is um, in leadership itself, but also in communication. And I think some of the work I try to do and some of the things I try to advocate for um, during my mandate is this intergenerational leadership. I see Mama Hana Tete there and we worked with her former office on incredible initiatives, especially on silencing the guns. The whole campaign was around peace and security, but it's, it's been very much the young people can be part of the conversation when it's youth peace and security. Uh, the young people can be part of the conversation when they're sharing their experiences, when you know, someone like Victor doing amazing work in Uganda, but the young people are not actually, when something happened in Sudan, talked to, what, how do you see the way out of this? It then you find, or, or even in Ethiopia, the people who, who you see the round table around the negotiation, and it's a complete different generation. And I think the, to, to bridge that gap really, we need, and we've done a lot of intergenerational dialogues, so we've done actually 100 dialogues, but we need to move from that dialogue and, and understanding each other, understanding each other languages, um, 
understanding where we come from, that your, your liberation struggle and where we, you came from in the 60s, yeah, and we acknowledge that, but we have a different reality. And we're not going to live on that. Uh, and we have a new redefining of Pan-Africanism, and we have new mission, and we, have, and we need to realize that. And we have new tools. Even if you look at protests, actually in Tunisia, we were the first to start a Facebook page to invite you for a protest in front of the Ministry of Interior. That's how it all started. And that's when people started to use social media as a tool for social change. So even our tools, you didn't have WhatsApp and Facebook at the time, and you did incredibly, and you did transnational solidarity. But once we have that dialogue and we understand where do we come from, when the other generation understand why are you not engaged in politics? Maybe it's also a language. Maybe it's also a political statement. Maybe it's not only because I don't want to be in politics or politics is the difficult way to go to do change and I prefer to be in civil society. No, there's so many barriers to go into politics. Um, once we have that understanding and once we have that honest dialogue, now we need to move to co-leadership. And co-leadership shows up in ways where um, at the African Union, the way we did it, for example, is to have heads of state and government appoint uh, in ministerial and uh, parliamentary position when they have in, in parliaments, they actually have seats that they can appoint, give them to the, to the young people. Uh, when you have special advisors on youth, when you have a meeting, co-chair it with young. So it was really like going deeper into your day-to-day -day, um, decision-making process Look around you, do you have young people part of this conversation? Not as your intern, and not as the one who is making coffee, as the one who is actually doing the research and presenting it, as the one who is um, uh, putting the findings at the end of the paper to, to move forward. So intergenerational community should manifest in a different way, and we can, if we have time, talk about women as well, because I think young women are lost in this peace and security agenda as well, and we need uh, to pay particular attention to their leadership in this process. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aya. There's a, there's a lot there and a lot to unpack. I won't touch it for now, and I'll come to Victor. Victor, Aya has already started us on, on the question that was coming to you, which was on intergenerational exchange and um, collaboration. But what would you like to add to that? And please, um, anything else that you might want to touch on, even that some of your colleagues um, have, spoken, have spoken about, but bearing in mind also the question about you know, peaceful, peacefully responding or peaceful engagement with, these issues, with some of these issues. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, and I appreciate my colleagues. Uh, I think what is important, I don't know how many minutes I have. You have three minutes. Three? Whoa, can I have four? <laughs> Okay, I'll try to get something done. <laughs> okay, please, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, my organization, all our choices was driven by our own experiences, you know. Uh, sometimes in the face of hardship, you just feel small. You feel small, you feel powerless, you feel hopeless. You look in and out, you wonder if the government cares or international community really understands you. So this is the kind of feeling that provokes the question, why do some people fight? Why others don't fight? I think that should be the young question, the question by the young people. Why is that some of us fight and some of us don't fight? Is it because they are weak? Is it because they are, they are lost? Or is it because they are uneducated? Because when you talk about protests, it's also a lot more to do with the urban settings, not about the rural settings. But think about the streets in our hearts. Think about the streets in our history, the corridors of life we are walking, full of ethnic injustice, tribal crises, politics of poverty, make others poor, make others rich, all these kind of hatreds. These are all corridors of the life that we are walking as Africans. So we should be able to ask ourselves, why is that some of the young Africans fight and others don't fight? And in the moment, in the environment of chaos and confusions, clouding our spaces we have today, how do we as a young generation come forward and unconfuse the environment? I think this is the kind of thing that we should be thinking about. Coming back to this, of course, what we started was we realized that in as much as we are looking for change, let us also understand our limits. If we have to avoid repeating exactly what we have gone through, what we don't want to live in. And that's why we said, let us come together as people affected by war, let us bring our pain, our suffering, 
we, you know, we transform our trauma into an opportunity for leadership. And that's why we say that we should become a community coming together not to protest, but coming together to change other people's lives. And that was our choice. And for that, we have been able to focus on supporting the victims of war, trying to heal the society, because we know there is a chance for the generational transfer of trauma. Because every one of us here, at least at home, or in your religion, or in your community, or in your country, you have a community, a clan, or somebody that you think is, EOS is your enemy. We have a community, you know, an enemy nation, enemy clan, enemy political party. So it's our role as young people to make sure we reconcile that. So the charge I would always give is, even though as young Africans, we may not be responsible for the historical injustices, but it is our responsibility to make sure that it does not happen again. So on why we choose peace, you know, peace is liberating. I choose nonviolence in all forms of whatever we do. Peace is change, you know, it's change oriented in a way that we want to say we are driven by the truth of our, the true account of our life. We also want to step in in a way that we are not crumbling, we are not crushing the system, but we are trying to build. If we cannot build the system, then our movement is movement to nowhere. So if our movement cannot take us to a direction where we can build a society, uplift the community that has been shuttered down, then we, we don't need to be you know, uh, wondering why Africa is not changing. Well, Africa is not changing because we, are, we have not been able to embrace the real change. Change deeply you know, rooted in tolerance because we know for sure that you know, we are all told also that we are born differently. You know, it might be that gender, it might be that religion, but the beauty lies in our diversity. And it is a choice, it's a noble choice to see beyond our differences as cultures, as communities and all that. So, I know Africa is bleeding in many ways, uh, economically, but even before we think about going to the street to protest, have we provided alternative economic answer to youth criminality? I think that should be what we should think about. Let's think about what are the alternative answers to the youth criminality before we take them to the street. Because there's one taking them to the street, then what do you do with them in the street? If you do not have answer of how you are going to get them off street, there's no need to take them to the street. Otherwise, you are just going to set the whole community ablaze. So, comes down to the last thing I want to say is about the humility in our approaches. Because we know the young Africans are the center of attention. They're the center of fear, they're the center of hope, they're the center of uh, you know, opportunity as well. We're the opportunity for the continent, opportunity for the world. But are we humble enough to know that we are on a learning journey? I think this is the way we should look at it, that as young Africans, we do not know it all. There are great leaders who left for us trails to follow. They were murdered by people who divided and ruled. Those people are not gone. They are still there with us. So it's up to us to agree that we do not understand it all. We are always there to learn. We are always there to move forward, pursuing knowing that if it hurts me, it hurts my brother. It hurts me. So it's our responsibility to heal the community, heal the continent, heal our countries, <coughs> reconcile, and bring about opportunity for change. I think to me this is an opportunity that if we seek a future of Africa, where Africa will impact on world peace and stability, it will start with a new generation, the young African, the young people like us here. I know sometimes our senior brothers and sisters don't want to be called old. They want to be called senior leaders or elders. But they call you young people. There's a reason why they call you young people. Why don't they want to be called old people? So, I don't know. I don't know. You have the answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Victor, and just the emphasis there on, on values and values-led you know, engagement um, with so many of the challenges on our continent, um, especially trauma, dealing with trauma and the role that young people can play uh, in healing. Before we go to, the, um, to our audience, to our participants for questions, um, just to uh, look at the, at the screen, some of the factors that prevent those of us in the room from feeling at peace, um, unemployment, I think, is the one that stands out most uh, prominently. Mm -hmm. Insecurity, corruption, poverty, tribalism, 
anxiety, violence, some of the, some of the main ones. Um, so thank you very much for responding to that. I think we are ready with microphones in the room um, and we will take uh, a first round of questions um, and then we will come back for a second round before we, before we wrap up uh, for, for, for the day. So any, any questions please for our panelists or either on the findings from the research. Okay, we have a question here in the front, others. Okay, I see two over here, number four, and then you will be number five. Um, uh, yes, with uh, the, the, the young woman with the, with the white top, yes, thank you. And right. sorry if you could keep your questions as succinct as possible, thank you. All right, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tempu, uh, I work with Open Society Africa, and I'm from Cameroon. Being that I'm from Cameroon and from the English-speaking part of Cameroon, I want to express my solidarity with the people of Sudan. And I do that because the English-speaking people in Cameroon have been going through a very brutal war since 2018. And there's been a shortage of solidarity from across the continent. And my question is really related to that. Uh, you, you, you raised the issue, uh, that's matter, the issue of how Sudanese have managed to build a solidarity within Sudan. But what you increasingly see across Africa, of course there are youth movements that are trying to build cross-continental solidarity. But you see a lot of the conflicts in Africa are, they are localized, localized in the sense that when there's a conflict happening in Cameroon, it's mostly an issue for Cameroon and ECAS, obviously because of the AU subsidiarity principle. And I've been wondering how is it we can make it that when there is a conflict happening as it is in Cabo Delgado, it becomes the affair of every African young person. Because let's, let's face it, it's mostly young people who are affected by this conflict. <laughs> my, my second question, uh, a lot of the social movements that have led to some marginal changes in the continent, we, we see a trend where, and the Nigerians aptly describe this as monkey they walk, baboon they chop, right? The young people go to the streets. Um, they want certain changes to happen. The political class hijacks it, and right? And the agenda <coughs> of the young people completely gets miss, missing in, the, in, in whatever reforms uh, are made. So how, how do we prepare young people and these social movements to make sure that when you start an agenda, it becomes part of the political agenda all the way, so that it's not hijacked Thanks. at some point. Thanks, Thank Tim. You. Is, that, is that directed at anyone in particular? <laughs> to anyone, anyone on the panel. Yeah. Thank you so much. We had a hand, yes, please go ahead. Again, please, if you could keep it as succinct as possible. Yes. Pardon. Pardon me. Keep the question as short as possible. Okay. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you so much. My name is Caleb Ikenye. I am a law student here at the University of Nairobi. First and foremost, I would want to say thank you to all of you who have taken your time to, you know, expound to us the challenges that we are facing, mostly or rather specifically as Africans. Uh, there is one quote that says, peace is not the absence of war. But I will still want to add that peace is not the mere absence of war, but majorly the feeling of a of a, of a threat to peace. If I'm threatened, if my peace is, if my peace is threatened, then that one should, uh, you know, speak volumes about the absence of peace. Therefore, I'll want to direct a question. Uh, anyone among us, those panelists, do you think as Africans, we are making a step towards, you know, promoting that peaceful coexistence between communities? in our different countries. I was looking at an example of, uh, you know, the United States of America. They have at least had, is it 46, 46 presidents up to now? And they got independence nearly 300 years ago. But, you know, in terms of democracy, there has, no, there, there has not been, you know, a threat in terms of, uh, you know, issues to do with democracy in interrelationship with uh, with peace. So as Africans, are we really making a step towards, you know, promoting a peaceful coexistence amongst our communities? Thank finally, you so much. finally, just this one. <laughs> finally. Uh, 
in my own questions. research, I'm not a researcher, okay. but in my own reading and in my own interrogation of uh, how we are existing as African countries, the greatest issue that we are facing is political instability. Leaders who want to stay in power for the longest, therefore threatening democracy. How are we going to solve this issue? And I can see my brother there is laughing, or rather smiling. That is an issue in Uganda. You need to give us a solution. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, please proceed. And as short as possible, please, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Charles Cage from the Department of Diplomacy. Uh, my question then goes to the, I don't know if she's the current EU Youth Envoy or the former, but uh, she, you did touch base former, on... Former, former. Former, thank you. Uh, you touched based on uh, the issue on transition and the period within the 100 days. And um, my question then becomes, uh, how then do you do you then get, get engaged within that paradigm shift? Because uh, what you witness is that when you have uh, regime change, um, other things are set out that bring the vulnerability of the youth at par. Hence, as to what John Wang has brought about, violent extremism comes up. And so how then can the youth stir up uh, that paradigm shift? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we had, yes, that was, was your hand, and then it was, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate this uh, intergenerational conversation. My name is Gasheke. Gasheke, I am a coordinator of Madara Social Justice Center. I'm very inspired. Uh, some of this uh, work we do become subject of the research and study on social movement. But I want to pose a question to the, all the panelists. I have two questions, one to all to the panelists. In the last 30 years, our development partners has been imposing to us a liberal democratic transition. Uh, there cannot be a solution without an economic model of free market economy. Is, ha, has that been the problem that we cannot resolve political violence, social injustice, by using the, the, what they have been imposing to us? And uh, in solidarity with the people and youth from Sudan, uh, is this the problem for the Sudan people or the regional question? There is a very powerful intervention from the Egypt, a crisis in Ethiopia, an involvement of very many big powers. Is this the problem for only Sudan? But this should be invitation for the Pan-Africanists to provide a solution for this crisis and sectarian violence that is shaping up in uh, Thank Sudan. You. Thank you so much. Uh, next to you, yes. Um, good evening. My name is Christine Karanja, a student of University of Nairobi Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, taking development communication. So my question would be to Victor on accountability. How do we keep the elected leaders um, accountable, what are the checks and balances we as youth can use for that. Um, the other one would be the role of CSOs. I think uh, the lady on the far left um, has espoused on how a modern version of what is happening in Southern Sudan, which I hope we would emulate where it's social impact for in, indirectly towards a democratic or uprising in a sense. So um, that revolutionary charter, if replicated in our setting, how would you recommend we go about it and maybe tie into development issues, whether that's the sustainable development goals. Um, the other one is to, recom to commend Aya on the work you're doing on NALA. I, I'm a huge fan of your work, whether that's from COP27, and maybe ask what is it you're looking forward to for COP28 and how such issues tie into political um, agenda, because we've seen our very own president tie, into, tie that into um, the issues and how not to make that a, um, a tokenism in a sense, so how do we keep them accountable overall? 
because for instance, Kenya is hosting the Africa Climate Week. So how do we ensure it's not just um, airplay or fluff when they say they are going to do this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to take three more questions. Um, yes, I see a hand at the back. Um, and then uh, we'll come to, to, to the lady behind you first, and then we'll come to you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Mary Ojuang from the Institute of Development Studies. I'm a student. And my question goes to Aya. Thank you for making the observation on inclusion, that when it comes to the questions about youth inclusion, it's about participation in boardroom and workshops. And rather, when it comes to the agency moments and critical decision making, that's where they draw the line. So my question is, is that, is it a question of conflict of interest? And if so, how do we resolve it? Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Barbara Njenga. I'm a, an IDS student here at the University of Nairobi. Um, mine is more of a reflection than a question. Um, the discussion has really centered around um, the political leaders and their lack of support for youth and youth-led initiatives. And I think one of the panel panelists even described it as contestation. So I, I wanted to throw it back to the youth. Yes, there is... Uh, a challenge from the side of the leadership, but also we as youth have a responsibility and um, it is on us to be accountable for the positions that demand for us to be leaders because we see a lot of youth being uh, misused, used and abused to drive uh, political agendas and narratives that then kill um, the efforts that are going towards uh, empowering the youth. So I'm just reflecting on how our youth can better be empowered to take a position, take a stance, and really um, uh, fight for youth leadership and youth-led initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, can we bring the microphone down, please? Youth have passion to become leaders but they don't have the patience. Right now, during our own time, we used to read well, we read well, 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 and then make sure that you even understand the concept. You also tell us that the leaders don't have the manifestos. Lead, young youths are coming up now without manifesto. Though that lead me to, how do we ensure that the institutions, the leaders, and then that leads to what the African Leadership Center and others need to provide leadership development programs. And I could give the example of what we did while I was in CDD in 2000. We have the women lawyers from Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. They called them Shikwata. We brought them to UK then to come to IDS, uh, LIS, and then uh, there are three universities I was coordinating. And I'm happy with what we are. We got money from Ford Foundation to bring them here, lawyers, for master's program in development studies in political science and governance. Quite a lot of them are your peers. Yeah. That's a way. So I implore our sister here. They've been doing it, but people should just train themselves. We cannot blame the leaders all the time. Mm -hmm. Ourselves. Because transition, when they hand it over to you, mm. then they say they hijack it. If you have got the sense, mm. they will not hijack it from you. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank can you. you. Can you introduce yourself, please, sir? Before you take the microphone away, can he, we want to know who he is. Uh, yes, yeah, your name, please. Okay, I'm Ambassador Dr. Remy Ajibewa, uh, direct, former director of uh, ECOWAS for 17 years. I've just retired December, but I'm now an independent consultant and a visiting professor at the uh, Bayes University. Thank you so much. We'll be inviting you for some of that training. Thank you for volunteering yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, we had a, a hand down here, please, and then we'll come to you. Yes.
Thank you, Shivai, and thank you to each of the panelists. I enjoyed your insightful uh, contributions. I don't have a question, it's more of a reflection. Um, just two things I wanted. Sorry? Who you ah, are? Sorry. My name is Titi Ajayi, I'm a Nigerian scholar based in Ghana. Uh, so, reflections, two things I wanted to pinpoint. We've talked a lot about some of the structural challenges to greater youth political participation. So, education, I think, is one area that is suffering. Um, coming from Nigeria, I can tell you that the quality of university education certainly has gone down significantly in recent years. I had an extensive conversation with Tem yesterday about how the conflict in the northwest of Cameroon has destroyed a lot of the educational infrastructure. Um, he was also telling me how history, for example, has been taken off the curriculum. Now, if you take away from a person their sense of who they are, where they are coming from, how they belong in the country, it automatically cuts their ability to make a meaningful contribution to that country's development. So, um, that's one area I think that needs to be looked at critically. The second is a fundamental conceptual problem that I think we have across Africa. Um, and it, it's, it stems from our culture and how we see leadership and, and headship as the prerogative of elders, and I use that in, in inverted commas. Um, and I think we need to come to a point where we normalize the involvement of young people in political spaces, whether it's at the government level or, or, or elsewhere. Um, we need to, and maybe it speaks also to how we raise our children, um, encourage young people to have an opinion, to express it, and not to be shut down just because there are young people in spaces where you know, there are a lot of older people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we'll take the last question over here, unless there's any other um, hand. I don't see any, so we'll take one last question before we come to the panel. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Boaz Ogada. I'm from the Institute for Climate Change Adaptation. And first and foremost, I just want to thank the organizers of this event and our speakers for today. And um, from my research, I aim to enhance the knowledge between the science, policy, and practice interface. And the youth form a very big role in such discussions. And uh, bringing the knowledge uh, that I've learned together with the discussions that we've had today, we, it's clear that Africa faces multi-level, multi-dimensional challenges, which are not just um, occurring in silos. And um, from the discussion is that we need concrete solutions going forward, right? So my question will be, do we have holistic program, holistic program that addresses all these issues all together? Because solving them in um, disciplinary sets uh, will not get us where we want to reach as such. We need to look, them, look at them holistically and promote all the sustainability goals all together. So my question is, do we have such programs in place? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. One last question uh, behind you, and then we'll come, to the, we'll come to the panelists. Good afternoon. I am Yasin Njai. I'm a current fellow at the, at the African Leadership Center. Um, I don't have a question. I think I have more, so just three words I want to throw into the conversation. And um, it will be consciousness, ideology, and identity. And I'd like for us all to just consider or contemplate on how we would like these three words to be um, involved in how we um, engage as youths in our politics, but also how we bound together. I think in many instances, youth movements are triggered by um, issues like poor governance, um, police brutality, etc. But I think with regards, specifically with regards to how we want to move forward, there's what triggers us, which is the issues, but also what keeps us together and what keeps the movements going should be very much linked to what um, a collective identity should look like, what, um, I, what our ideology is, and what our consciousness is, and also just journeying towards a commonality with regards to these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, thank you for all those questions and comments. I'm going to uh, come to the panel now, and um, we'll start. We'll go in the opposite direction now to, to res for responses. Um, there were a lot of questions, but also many comments and many, you know, reflections. So you don't have to respond to everything. Just what um, uh, was asked directly to you, and anything else that you might want to comment on. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for the questions. There are a lot of answers in the many of the questions. This is a very rich conversation. I wanted to just start with Ambassador. I think impatience is good because if we're going to follow what our current leaders and the pace they're going with, we're not going to go anywhere. I think youth impatience and the radical energy they bring can push this leadership, can accelerate these plans. I'm sure you were impatient yourself, um, and you got things done because of that impatience. I, I, I would take it more as a positive energy, but just to channel it in the right way. Because I think even a protest, I never see protest something negative, but it's how to challenge the energy of young people in the protest to advocate, to get things done, to move the agenda, and not channel it to violence and go to violent extremism and, and just, uh, you know, um, go in the direction of violence. So I think, just, just to say that, I think impatience is very good. Um, the inclusion uh, question, I think it's a question of maintaining the status quo. Uh, again, being young means, being again, being radical. And I think um, a lot of people, whether we say older generation or senior or whatever we want to call it, but at some point in the institution, you like progress and you want to see progress because you already agreed on certain things and policies but you don't like change. And when someone comes in to disrupt the whole thing and actually change the paradigm shift, then you're, you're in trouble. You're not really serving the agenda. I think we, that's where we need the, the co-leadership. We need to understand where each other are coming from and why do we need this change to advance the same agenda. We're not trying to you know, uh, uh, just put aside everything you achieved, but it's really how do we move faster and, and reform. I think on the transition period, I think two people asked uh, on this question. Um, again, someone mentioned around when you have a transition. It, in Tunisia, it happened. A, a portion of us went to civil society and built a very, very strong civil society in 2014. We got the Nobel Peace Prize to Tunisian civil society. It's the first Nobel Peace Prize to a society, not to one person. So it really showed how much we, we built that. But also, a big portion went to um, Daesh. Actually, the, the debated numbers are 8,000 young Tunisians went to Daesh in 2014. My cousin was radicalized, and he was among, uh, among them. Um, a lot of other people, actually, the highest Mediter people dying in the Mediterranean was also between 2014 and 2015. So yes, when you have a transition, there is a huge risk of desperation when people don't see what they were fighting for, what their sons died for, what you know, people who are still blessed today lost their legs, lost their arms, lost their eyes from being in the protest of the revolution. They don't see justice and they don't see what they fight for happening. And so desperation can lead them to other avenues. And I think to answer your question on also transition, we need to think of the before, the during, and the after. And concretely, from my experience, before the transition as a youth movement, we need to have the 100 days plan. Because sometimes we don't believe change happens or change is possible until it happens. We never thought we could end a 23 years dictatorship, to be honest. You're on the street, you try your best, you fight every day, you know, but you don't know, you, know, you never know it's going to happen. When, and when it happens, you don't have a plan. <laughs> and so I think in, the youth, in any youth movement, whatever you're fighting for, you need to have that plan. If you achieve what you're fighting for, what, what is the next step? When it happens, so when we are during um, a revolution, I think we need other actors to help us. Because when you are in action, when you are in a transition, in a revolution time, believe me, every day is like one year. So many things happen in every hour that you can't keep up with everything. And that's where I think regional institutions, United Nations, African Union, international actors can come in and provide that space of thinking. We're not in a thinking mode, we're in an action mode. So providing us with that space of thinking and what are the next steps and what are the scenarios and that will really be helpful. Then the after, I think once we, we do have a revolution, we do have, we are in the middle of a transition, things are you know, advancing, I think the Pan-African exchange is extremely important. Something uh, we've done years ago when the Shut It All Down movement started in Namibia, 
We brought the Fees Must Fall activists to talk to the Shut It All Down in Namibia. How did they do the, their movement? What are the failures? What are the success? Uh, and, and we say it all the time, right? In these circles, we, we are the best to learn from each other. We don't need to read some Eurocentric or US-centric nonviolent movement to, to know really what can we do because we live under, under same structures. We came out from similar struggles. So really learning from each other and the move, the, these movements happened the past decade, the past 10 years. Uh, there are a lot of learning that you know, Nigerian young people can learn from Tunisia, what, what happened and where we are today. So I think that Pan-African space is so important to continue and continue consolidating that. On, maybe the last thing I can share is on the peaceful coexistence. I think, uh, I think Victor will, will talk to that more, but for me and what happened recently in Tunisia, um, Afrophobia is one thing that we have to really address. And we, we cannot address it as a response, and when it happens, and now we have to deal with it. Um, I don't know if, you, if you, I'm sure, I mean, it's not, a, <laughs> it's not a good news to be known for, but you know, just three weeks ago, we had a state statement that uh, you know, uh, other Africans should go back to their countries, and that they're taking our jobs, and whatnot. It was a whole anti-blackness, racist, fascist campaign, right? State campaign. Um, and you know, some of the reflections we've been having also as uh, you know, feminists in the space and Pan-Africans in the space that we need to address to your point of identity. You know, we need Pan-African education. We need space, honest, open space to talk about identity. What does it mean to be African? And we need to address it not from the, um, this, I think we need to move forward from this Arab, African, you know, Arab is not a race. I just speak Arabic. <laughs> it happens, I happen to be born in Arab speaking country, but being African is the identity. Um, and, and that conversation, if we like it or not, is about blackness. And we need to be honest about it. What, what is this anti-blackness movement happening across the continent? Uh, yesterday, South Africa, today is Tunisia, what's tomorrow? And how can we address it? And that's why a borderless Africa is so important that we live in each other countries, we understand each other culture, we are educated by each other's struggles and books. <laughs> you know, the first book that I got outside of the, um, you know, North African writing was in 2012 in Nigeria, Achino Achebe. So that was the first book I landed my hand on after 23 years on some other thinker, you know, that is not Tunisian or North African. So. Uh, someone talked about education. I think that's part of the education. We definitely need to address Afrophobia on preventive, not on a responsive measure. The final thing I would, um, I would end with, I really wanted to talk about uh, gender, but I, th I think there's not much time. Um, but the final thing to young people here, I think, uh, you know, it's our future at stake. Um, so whether we like the situation we are in or not, this university is, will pass by like this, and then you will be hit hard by reality. So involvement starts now um, with your university club, with your university union. I, I started my activism in university. I've been in every single club, in every single extracurricular something. I have to learn the skills, and you learn it by doing. You don't need to go on a paid course. You don't need to, you just learn it by going out there and getting involved. And then once you, you finish university, get involved really, um, run for office, join an advocacy group, um, start your own organization. It, the path is not easy. Mm. And it doesn't mean that it's on a silver plate. Mm. Uh, you have to fundraise, you have to do the work, but it's worth it. It's worth it for the next generations. Mm. We don't live for ourselves today. Mm. We live for the, for, for the future. Mm. So I think it is important that all of us realize whether we want to blame the system, whether we want to complain about it, whether we want to tweet about this corrupt leader and this corrupt leader, that's the reality. How are we from our position going to change that? And that conversation with you starts now. It's the best year, actually, university is to start that reflection. And with that, please consider in your... In your um, curriculum and your writing and you're educating yourself pan-Africanism. What is your identity? What pan-Africanism means for us? Solidarity. Solidarity is not posting a Facebook picture and say, I'm in solidarity with. It is really showing up. It's really checking in. It's Cameroonian activists talking to uh, Sudanese activists. Whatever you can is signing a petition is whatever you, action you can do. 
stand up for Pan-African solidarity. So that would be really my, my message. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aya. Um, yes, you give her a hand. Thank you. And uh, we'll have to find a way to, for you to speak on the gender issues and the gender dynamics that you didn't get a chance to touch on. John. Thank you. Uh, I'll just speak quickly to, I think, Kenya's question. And uh, it was around uh, peace and, 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 and whether Africans, well, as Africans are making any steps uh, towards peaceful coexistence. And I think uh, this, this sort of reflection uh, circles at the end of it all to uh, the question of governance, but also how we accommodate each other. Uh, and I think that's a whole uh, sort of uh, socialization, but also a personal kind of initiative. Yes, uh, there's only much you can do in governance if you're not seated on the other side of the table. But I, but I think, uh, because if, if you're to look at, you know, how, for instance, a lot of social movements rise, they do rise on the basis of grievances, right? And these grievances would be linked to a particular quarter or entity. But of course, we have to move beyond the blame game and, and see what, you know, what roles we can take. Uh, for instance, I think nobody is taught, or I mean, you're not born to hate, for instance. You know, when people express ideologies such as you know, genocide and things like those, it's, it's perhaps a socialization process, right? It's, it's something that is normalized through maybe language, through you know, communication, through particular narratives and so on. So I think a point of self-reflection about uh, what, what, what is possible. Uh, for instance, if for instance, we aspire to uh, a corruption-free world, for example, it calls upon us, for example, now to you know, to, to live to that premise, right? It might be painful, it might be costly, but taking a particular kind of steps to that. So governance is important, uh, but also accountability across the process. Uh, when it comes to electoral politics, for example, I think our points of engagement really are just around the voting process. But post the voting process, I think we always think about the next cycle. So, but I think it's an encouragement uh, when there is I mean, when there's participation in, say, a county government that is coming up with a particular bill. How many of us are participating in those kind of processes? So, I think it's just taking that uh, that role, and then you know, just being accommodative to each other, and then the system hopefully works for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Victor. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues. And I want to start with a question that came from somewhere there about the leaders not leaving power. Man, I'm from Uganda. I want to go back home. Eh? <laughs> I don't want you to provoke me to say something that will block me from. <laughs> yeah, well, to begin with, we have all played with balloons, isn't it? Whether super tele or balloon or something that blows up. We have all seen that. Always, politics is also like a balloon. All power is like a balloon. The more you blow it, it looks more beautiful, beautiful, more attractive, because it's more nicer to hold. But that's when it's about to blow. And when it blows up, you don't get it back. It's gone. That's how politics is. History has taught us very clear that those who have gone that path, it ended up the way that it did, right? It ended up in the way the balloon ended up always. So let's just, I know you played with balloon, go and look through your balloon, or go and try one today, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. I want to go back home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then uh, on the issues, of course, it does not mean that I don't condemn whatever I think is not right. You know, what we need to do is to set the right precedence for our young Africans. If I, of course, if I were to meet my president today, I would ask him the question, how long in power would he want the next president after him to stay? I would want to ask, uh, that is a non-political question. It is a peaceful question, right? Uh, 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 oh, maybe the next bit is where the problem. Oh, there will be next president. Whether they like it or not, there will always be next president. So, but at the end of the day, these are the kind of things that we need to just be able to 
mentor, inspire, and raise the young generation knowing that power is shared. Power is about people, it's about everybody, it's about inclusion, and it's about knowing that we can live together, we can uh, lead side by side. But of course, does it matter when it comes to peace? Yes. Social peace is a product of social justice. It comes to what he was talking about that, you know, uh, how much do we hold our political leaders accountable? Without accountability, it's a big deal. But also, let's look at it this way. We talk about accountability, talk about corruption. It's the, obviously the most difficult thing to fight in any government. Corruption is a government on its own in any country. You start fighting against corruption, you need your own army. <laughs> you need your own government. Because you alone, hmm? everybody will gang around you, there's a cartel of misbehaved or misconceived or mis, mis, you know, misinformed generation. So we need to definitely know that fight against corruption is a big deal, but accountability when it comes to, I think what we have seen that works on our side is uh, when you engage a local population to demand for the, the service delivery, it's a fairly a better neutral and welcoming voice that comes in from that angle. I think sometimes leaders also, we don't want to appeal for them to separate power. We just want to appeal in, in, for their humanity in them, for them to see that, you know, we are not just calling them to, to step out or to share whatever they have, but just be human for a second to imagine what would you feel if you were the one being governed by one person for the rest of your life? What would you feel if you were the one being excluded from all the development aspects? It pains, it hurts. But the question what is, why do other people not fight? That's what keeps us moving forward. Because we want to avoid the repeat of everything bad that we saw happen when we were growing up. And lastly, uh, going back to what Aya talked about a little bit on the issues of uh, uh, agreeing to live side by side. Definitely our continent, as Africa, is hard and it, it's, it's such a, all the researches that come from Africa, majority of them gives a very big and negative bloody picture of the continent. But is it true or not true? It's true, it's happening. There's a lot of things that's going on. Right now we are seeing the geopolitical interest on Africa, the geostrategic wishes. Sooner or later, there are already growing superpowers, you know, rivalries around Africa. The question is, what are we as young people shaping our agenda, our thinking, our bargaining power around that? Because if we don't do anything, our leaders in power are already won by, they already got their allies. What about us, the generation, the new generation, the young generation? We also need to understand what is important. Are we going to just follow the footsteps of the, the leaders who have already benefited for the rest of their life? They have secured their, you know, for, for their families for the rest of their life. No, we need to also think and say, you know, as Africans, we are not an enemy to any nation or any superpower around the world. We want to build a relationship of friendship based on true sense of accountability, uh, based on human peace and security, and so that African resources are used to develop African people, so that African people can live free from fear of death, move away from the shadows of injustice and death that we see every new day. This is my appeal, and I hope that we will have the right voices right now in a way that will give us opportunity to challenge the world. We are not competing, we are not sending weapons, but we are welcoming partners who are committed in promoting human peace. At the end of the day, it's all about humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Ma Malda? Um, so I just want to say, I think we've forgotten how interdependent our liberation was, right? Um, because when Nkurma at Ghana's independence said this, right, Ghana's independence is going to be predicated on the basis of the liberation of other African countries. And we literally had a transnational struggle. And even the end of apartheid came because not only Africans within the continent, but African Americans and other black des descendants of Africans came together to, you know, uh, go against this injustice. So I think, first of all, kind of using my sister's recommendation of ideology, I think we don't like because of the counter-revolution that happened after the 70s and the 80s. We've kind of rejected Pan-Africanism as this, like, oh, something that failed. But really, it's not. And. I think in the process we've forgotten what solidarity looks like, right? Outside, especially of a, like a, a social media post. And so, um, when you ask the question, when there is a conflict, it becomes the affair of everyone. I, I think of like 
Even what's happening in Cameroon, how many of us have information about what's happening? Where is our media sources coming from? How are we getting educated? The question of formal education, I grew up in Ethiopia, I learned history, I learned no African history almost, right? I knew nothing about my people, right? I had to go outside, I had to go to the United States to learn my master's in Pan-African studies, right? So there are these issues of narratives, whether it's the media, whether it's our formal education system, we have no idea what's going on in other parts of the world. So solidarity, so that's why today I took a stand to really talk about Sudan, because I'm like, perhaps communicating with each other about what's really happening in the ground is so important for us to even attempt to uh, begin to think about solidarity. And so, um, kind of, my brother said, the greatest issue is leadership, and I want to tie this into that. And so, I just want to push back and say, I think the greatest issue in Africa is imperialism, right? And imperialism is a system, as like my co-panelists have pointed out. So, and in this system, our leaders, African leaders, are but they're neither are they the owners of the system, neither are they the leaders of the system, but they are just players in the system. So when we look to the Congo for uh, um, solidarity, right, what's been happening to the Congo since the day Patrice Lumumba was killed, right? Why do we not have solidarity uh, 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 across uh, Africa for the Congo? And why are Rwanda, and who, are, who is supporting Rwanda and Uganda to destabilize the Congo? These are questions we really need to ask. And part of the strength of the Sudanese movement is that they interrogated what are the systems of oppressions and exploitation that are affecting us. Part of their rejection of foreign intervention came from an understanding that it is a system of oppression. It's not the military alone. The military as it stands today, why we are seeing what we are seeing today is because different external forces were supporting different factions of the military in different ways, right? So when we ask about why is there solidarity in Sudan, let me explain. 1956 is the, when the independence of Sudan came. 1953 is when the deliberations of independence, right? The British were negotiating with elites. 1953 is when Southern Sudanese started protesting because this vision of the state from its inception did not account for them, right? And then we saw all the way, 2011, we saw the cessation. 2003, in Darfur, violence began. What was the, the state's uh, version of what was happening? Oh, it's, it's rebels in Darfur. You know the Darfurians, you know, all ethnic, like the same thing that's going on in Ethiopia, right? Politics took this ethnicized and militarized form. But in 2018, they had seen, by 2011, South Sudan seceded, got its independence. 2011 is also when Blue Nile and South Kordofan armed movements began and more violence started. Darfur was, massacres were happening. So the Sudanese people have learned these manipulation systems and they understand them. So in 2018, when protests erupted in peripheral areas of uh, not Khartoum, which is usually the center and that's where protests start. Protests did not start in Khartoum in 2018, but other parts of Sudan. When it started, uh, Omar al-Bashir went out and said, oh, this is the Darfurians and attempted. There were protests in Khartoum saying we are all Darfur, you know? So I think the youth need to understand that transformation is going to take understanding our conditions and understanding what we've been designed to think and kind of either rejecting it or reforming it, you know? Um, and so, um, yeah, and, and my brother, you, you left, but you, you gave the US as a model for democracy. I would urge you to think about the African Americans that are being killed by state police. Right? And to, is that the vision of democracy we want to develop? Like, what is democracy for Africa? I think that also requires us to re-interrogate -inter what is happening, who we are, what we want to see in the world. Africa is the richest continent in the world, but it is framed as the poorest continent in the world. You know, those contradictions are things young people are not asking. Instead, young people, we're looking to the West, we're looking to other areas, and I understand why, right? I can't even say that. Um, so, in terms of what you asked me, brother, about this regional context of the Sudan, what's going on in Sudan, you're right. Egypt, who is also who is number one, Egypt's uh, uh, number one funder, military funder. It's the U.S. So Egypt is also playing a huge role in Sudan. And what is Egypt is doing is Egypt is supporting the Sudanese armed forces, SAF. That's one faction of the military that's fighting right now. But the other faction, Hemeti, which controlled gold mines in the Darfur and other regions, has autonomous relations with other countries like the UAE. Wagner 
has a good relationship. Russia is, is, so you have what my brother said. It's a superpower contestation that is being manifested with these different uh, uh, military factions that are now fighting it out, right? And this is not a civil war. A friend of mine told me the civil war in Sudan yesterday. I'm like, this is not a civil war. This is two military factions that are getting autonomous support from two, from different external forces fighting it out to grab more power. But yes, and, and the implications for the region are huge, right? Like the borders, like, because, so I'll stop there, but the implications are huge. We can talk about this during uh, uh, the Q&A, the refreshment the session. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I do want to say, last thing, my sister, you asked if we should adopt the Revolutionary Charter. I want to say this is the third time the Sudanese have removed a military regime from power, right, in 2018. So they have developed their own ways and methods, right? And I think as young people, we need to understand, and I would like, you know, I would call to Aya and what she said, you, everybody needs to organize. Within that organizing, I think we're going to find the path, right? I think we can take their methods, they organized autonomously, they organized horizontally, they made sure to organize nationally, they made sure to incorporate workers, they made sure to incorporate farmers, I think these will be necessary for any of our revolutions or uprisings to be successful, but I think we don't adapt it. We talk to them, we learn from their experiences, then we organically build our own in our societies, right? Because it's self-emancipation, right? That is what we're looking at. And so, that being said, thank you all for such great questions. <laughs>